crashed a couple times. Um, so, uh, all right. here. Okay, so my name is Jared Otley. Um, I'm part of the integrations team with Alfresco. Um, last year, we, we talked about Dropbox and the Jive Toolkit. We're going to talk about them a little bit today, but we're also going to talk about some of the things that we've done uh, as an integrations team. We've now grown um, to being more than just me. Um, and we're going to talk about the, the Google Docs integration uh, and some of the things that we learned while we were doing that. Uh, hopefully some stuff that will be useful to you. So um, let me log in here. So um, one of the things I want to show you, oh, that's really small. Um, it's probably not. <laughs> Let's see, let's change. Those don't get better. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, how does that look in the back, really bad? Can you see it at all? Eh. All right, um, okay, let's try to change that resolution. Hopefully this will work out. So, um, start my presentation. So, one thing to note about my presentation is I wanted to make sure that what you're seeing is um, not doing that. Okay, so let's move to. Okay. Um, created this presentation entirely using the Google Docs integration. So we'll give it a second here as it goes through and grabs stuff. We're going to use, as everything loads up here, um, just to show what is possible with this Google Docs integration. Okay. All right. So those are loading. Okay, so like I said, we're going to talk about some of the projects we're working on, the current status of the Jive Toolkit, uh, Dropbox integration. We're going to talk about how we use Maven uh, and uh, kind of our little mandate we have. And we're going to talk about the Google Docs, uh, the Google Docs integration, what's new about it. We're going to talk about what's new in the product um, that, that we helped to, to build on and some of the things that we use or some of the things that we've done within that as well. Okay, so as I said, it started off with just with me uh, as, this, uh, as, as, an, as the only integration engineer. Then about three months later, Peter Monks came on, and he was our project manager as well as project manager for the services, services team, API, documentation, all, all those sorts of things. And then Will Absin uh, joined, joined, and he made everything look pretty. <laughs> um, okay, so some of the projects that we worked on, apparently, uh, of course, we worked on the Google Docs integration, um, which will be uh, going at some point into cloud. Uh, it will go into enterprise, and it's currently available in the 4.2 release of Community. Um, we took ownership of things like uh, Hyperic plugin, which is now available in Community. We own the Cofax integration, the XAM connector, which is available for enterprise, S3 connector, which is cloud and enterprise, the Salesforce integration that's coming up. Um, we're starting to take ownership of, of that, which is going into cloud, the Jive Toolkit, Dropbox connector. Um, both of those you can note that worth a little bit of that. We've also uh, created a couple of Spring Social projects, Spring Social Dropbox, which is a fork of, uh, of the project that's out there, expanded the functionality in that. Uh, we created a Spring Social Google Docs um, and Spring Social Alfresco. So if any of you guys went to the REST API uh, course, that uses um, Spring Social Alfresco as well as um, Dave Gilda's presentation with the GWT application against cloud. It uses Spring Social Alfresco. Um, we've contributed to Alfresco, we've contributed the OAuth 1 and 2 persistent services, which we'll talk about today. 
Um, we also made contributions to the PDF toolkit, stuff for share extras, bug fixes for the Maven AMP plugin. There's a Java cores filter, which we've added functionality to um, and was accepted into that. Um, Will did the Welsh language pack, share import extra Python scripts, Ubuntu quick start scripts to help you get your Alfresco instance up and running really quickly on, an, on Ubuntu. Uh, yesterday, or Monday, in the, in the hackathon, um, we worked on WordPress Alfresco plugins, Seamus plugins, that make it so you can see uh, content in your Alfresco instance uh, in share as a, I can't remember what those are called, um, widget. Uh, and then built a, an Alfresco to community cloud migration utility that allows you to be able to take a site in a community instance and copy all the content over into a cloud site. And we've done more than that as well. Um, what does the future hold for us? Right now, our primary focus is on the Salesforce integration, but we have a pretty fluid thing until we commit to a project. Once we've committed to a project, that's what we're going to work on. Um, and right now, what we are committed to is Salesforce. Okay, so first, the Jive Toolkit. Um, the Jive Toolkit is a set of pre-built components that allows you to be able to take content that's in Jive or content that's in Alfresco and socialize it to the Jive social framework. Um, and they appear then as uh, native Jive documents within the Jive interface. Um, but they are maintained, persisted, live their life inside of Alfresco. Uh, its availability was released in early 2012. Uh, and it has a currently supported release by Alfresco, Alfresco support team of, uh, of 105, uh, and that's for Alfresco 341. So if you're on 34 and you're looking to use the Jive Toolkit, that's there. Uh, and it is available through the support portal. Um, we've, for the 1.1 release of Alfresco, we've, uh, we've made that a Google Code project. The link is on the slide, but the slides are all available um, from, the, from the site uh, for this session. Uh, and that is for 4.1. Um, <coughs> so this is a community project that is looking for help, looking for assistance. It's going to be taken ownership, ownership by a solution set. They're going to be the lead on this. They're our partner that helped us build. They, they're the ones that knew the Jive side and helped us build all of the Jive stuff. And so it is looking for developers, testers, users, and documentation. So if you're interested in the Jive toolkit, have you know, experience with Jive, um, you want to help make an input because that project is still very young and it has a lot can be done with it. A lot of different information can be done with that one. Um, next is the Alfresco Dropbox connector. Uh, last year we, we demoed that. I think actually in London it had some problems, but it worked fine in San Diego. Um, it's a connector that allows you to be able to take content within Alfresco that is either your individual documents or folders and be able to send them to yours, the user who is initiating this, this sync uh, or this push to your Dropbox uh, account. Uh, it then keeps your documents in sync. If a document is updated in Alfresco, it will push those change out. It also allows multiple users, so if another user comes along and says, oh, that looks interesting to me, and they push it to their, they push it to their Dropbox account, it's going to sync across. Uh, if you have a folder that's synced and you add content into the folder, it's going to sync, uh, and the folder had been synced, any new content added to that folder, including new folders, will be synced to those accounts. And it's set up so that if you have multiple instances of Alfresco, they'll all go into their own directory structure under an overarching Alfresco directory within your Dropbox account uh, within that one. <coughs> it also supports manually taking content that you have synced to your Dropbox account and pulling that back in. That also then, if you pull the document in, it would then be synced out to everybody else's. Uh, it's currently available as a Google Code project. Um, uh, it's available as a support, as a community supported project, so if basically that's me and anybody else who wants to work on the project uh, to help support on that. And it works with Enterprise 4.1 and Community 4.2. Um, again, this project is looking for contributors, testers, documentation users. Um, one of the reasons why it hasn't made it out of the community, community problem is working around a problem of sync. Um, and sync is not just a Dropbox problem, it's a problem with most any integrations where you're pushing content from Alfresco or getting content to Alfresco and you want that to be a two-way relationship going back and forth. Pushing content, that's pretty easy. Pulling content in, that's pretty easy. But once you want to take them and make that relationship live, going back and forth, 
that becomes more difficult, uh, especially whenever you have the other side not really understanding the content lifecycle or how to manage content. Dropbox is basically a, cloud, as a file system in the cloud with some nice little add-ons, has a revisioning and all that sort of stuff in it, but it's not a content management tool. It doesn't understand how content lives, it doesn't understand that content lifecycle, and so that causes some problems. One of those problems is the one-to-many whenever we try to sync. So in Alfresco, you have one document, and anybody can use that. But there's only one source of truth, and that's where that document is in, in, in Alfresco. Once you push that document out, when you push it out to something like Dropbox, there are now two possible, if you want a sync relationship, there's now two possible sources of truth for that document that have to be maintained for that. With Dropbox, since a Dropbox account um, does not have the ability, except for through their UI, to be able to share content from one user to another user, uh, that content now has to be pushed individually to everyone else's and ha can live independently of the content or the source of truth in this case, which we consider to be Alfresco. Uh, and so that becomes a very difficult problem then to handle if, when you start having multiple changes that need to occur, have to come back into Alfresco, and figuring out the correct order. We'll talk about, so, talk about in a second. Next is versioning. Dropbox has very poor support for, for versioning. It does have a revision history. Um, what, that is, uh, what that is is with each save, a, a version is created within, within Alfresco, but those revisions are only available for 30 days. Except if you buy or get a supported version of Dropbox, if you pay, put out some money to get, get more space in there, you then have the ability to install what they call Rat Pack, which allows you then be able to have content that lives longer or stays longer, has a longer revision history. But as an application developer against it, you have no way of knowing if that revision history is there and or any other extensions that they make available are there. So they have a very basic API for file system functionality um, with, again, like I said, some additional bells and whistles on that, but nothing really to help you understand what a user may have on that, whether they have a free account. Well, actually, you can't tell whether it's a free account, but you can't tell whether or not it's a, the extension is there. Revision numbers are alphanumeric characters, or alphanumeric string, and they're non-sequential. So there is no 1.1, 1.2, 2.0, it's AB2345. And the next one may be DCAB3. You don't know what that is, you can't predict what that is, and so it's very difficult then to know what revisions they can be, except for if you go by the modification date. But modification dates can't be trusted in Dropbox, because if a user is offline, the modifications that they had made, or that revision is created once they sync again, not upon when they save the document, the last save the document on, on their client machine. And so the revision histories don't match up. And so you have this one to many problem where you have all of these different users who have a, a document synced, and then you have this revision history problem where you don't know what may not be able to predict what the proper order is for the documents to be able to come in, which becomes a little bit of a nightmare. The next problem is when to know when files have changed. And there's two of these file change problems. The first is uh, Dropbox provides a Delta API, which gives you information about what has changed. The Delta API comes back with basically two fields. One is the path and the name to the file in Dropbox, and the other is a collection of metadata around that file. If that file, if that entry has the path and metadata, that means that the file is new, updated, moved, copied, renamed, but there's no indication to know which one of those events had occurred. At the same time, the Delta API, if you have an entry that comes back with just the name and no metadata on it, that means that the file has been deleted, it's been moved, it's been renamed. And you, so you don't know what operation has occurred in that. And so it becomes very difficult to use the, what, the, the, what they have provided to be able to, to know what file changes has, have occurred. So that leads you to the next option, which is polling to get information, which is very expensive, and it already drains your costly resources that you have in Alfresco, uh, if you're running it within Alfresco. So if we take a look at this problem, talk a little bit about a, of a story, if we have a document that someone has created, and they're on a team of four people, so they have their, their version of the document, we have then 
to, uh, one of their teammates who works in another office, and then another teammate who works in a different office, and a teammate who's always on the road. And they all look at the document, and they're all making different revision histories to it, or revision changes to that, and they need those all then to be synced back to the document. You need to be able to try to figure out, based off of the modification date, based off of the revision history, um, what can be or what is the source of truth when coming back in and the order that those should be placed into Alfresco. You know, this is not, like I said, this is not just a draw box problem, this is a sync problem in general of understanding the order. And if you aren't able to provide the necessary information to know what the life cycle or what the state of the document was when the change was made or what the change was, it becomes very difficult then to understand or know what the order is. Um, so that leaves us with a couple of options to be, uh, to be able to, to figure out what this problem is. Our proposed approach for this is one to handle this problem of resource allocation is to make this an out of process um, solution. So we're building a client or a standalone application outside of Alfresco that is a seamless client to Alfresco, being able to query and find out what content has been synced, which users have synced that content, and how to connect to Dropbox with, with that user's information. The other side of that uh, application is a RESTful client to Dropbox, to be able to make the queries into Dropbox, to be able to find out what is going on or what the state of content is within those. And then use some complicated al algorithms to be able to figure out what has happened. Now we can try to make and guess what is going to happen in or happen to those documents in the correct order, but we may not be the best judge of that, and usually the customer is. And so what we have to also figure out with that, which is a, just a general problem with Alfresco, in, uh, is a way to be able to handle conflict resolution. To be able to mark and say and tell someone there's a conflict with this, you need to resolve it. And that seems to be the best solution to, for what we need to be able to do. And so what we're looking to do is create an example, a proof of concept for how to, how to approach conflict, conflict resolution within Alfresco with this. So if you're interested in things like um, CMS, if you're interested in working against a cloud service like Dropbox, if you're interested in working to uh, working figure out some of these complex change order problems as well as trying to figure out a way to do conflict re resolution or offer a way to do conflict resolution within Alfresco, this may be the project for you and we'd love to have you uh, join that, join us on that one. Um, next, all of our projects use Maven. So when our projects, or if our projects, like the Google Docs one, which is available in the community, uh, the community SVN repository, you can take a look at the source code for that. Um, all of our projects are, use Maven. Currently, we're using either 3.4 or 3.05 snapshot of the Maven AMP plugin, so we're not using the full AMP, uh, AMP build. And once it's available for enterprise, which is our primary target of which we're building our integrations, um, we'll look at moving into the new uh, Maven SDK, which, the, which Gab and, and team have worked on. Um, to be able to get this Palms, to get, the, get our, our plugin working, we have to add it in either to your palm or to your settings.xml, one of these two re plugin repositories from Alfresco. Um, and these have, excuse me, they have the, uh, the plugin for being able to build, uh, build amps uh, through Maven. Um, all of your dependencies for Alfresco can be found at artifacts.alfresco.com. If you go where, there, uh, as community users, you have all of the community jar files that are available. For, for the whatever the latest release of Alfresco community is, as well as some of the past releases of that. Um, you also have the enterprise. So if you're an enterprise customer, you can get access through credentials to be able to get to the, to the enterprise releases of those, of, of those artifacts. When you're building your Palm then for it, you also want to add in uh, a packaging AMP, uh, a packaging declaration with, the, with AMP in it. And that will help it know, with that plugin, know that that's your target is building this AMP file. Now, in the repo or the share palm, we, we typically we divide our palms up or our amps into two. We have a repository amp and we have a share amp within those. Um, to be able to get the plugin, we add in our declarations then of what we need to do or how we need that to work. Uh, on the repo side, you'll want to make sure that you have this declaration of which files to exclude when you're building it or to have included when you're building it. We don't include that one in our share one. Uh, to do that, uh, to do, to do our plugins. 
also, the other thing to, um, to add is a share palm uh, for the plugin to do any minification of your JS files for the share client side, uh, uh, client side components. Uh, and this, this example, or this one right here, will get you, and, uh, get you what you need and be able to minify your files. Once you're done, and this is probably really small in the back, sorry, um, is that you then have this directory structure under, uh, that, that you would use to, to do that one. Uh, at the top level, you'll put your module.properties file for your AMP and your palm file. Uh, in there, then, you'll have your source directory, and in your source directory, you'll divide that up into uh, your main directory, where you have your main Java sources and your main resource files, and we'll talk about what goes on there in a second, and then your test uh, your test resources that go in there as well. Uh, a test directory that have, the, that have the same thing, so you can do those. Um, in your main, uh, main Java, you, that's where you put all your, your class files on that one. And the resources one, this is where, for the AMP file, you have an Alfresco directory, which, you, which then matches up to the um, WebInf classes Alfresco uh, directory, um, which would then have your extensions, your message, your module directory, where you then, uh, your module properties will end up in that one. Uh, if you need to have uh, uh, a modified web.xml, there's a web app, webinf directory that you can add, the, uh, you would add that into. And that would, be, it covers most of your cases for whenever you're building AMP files. Oh, that one. Uh, build command is pretty easy, maven clean package. Uh, and then you can skip the test if you don't, if you haven't done that one. The AMP uh, is output into the target directory, um, uh, and that will match the name that you put in your palm file. Uh, and then lastly, if you want to know what went into that AMP file, there's also a directory of the same name uh, in that target directory as the AMP file minus the AMP extension. You'll be able to go in there and be able to see the complete directory structure layout. So if you something didn't get put in there the right way, or you want to see what, what actually get put in there, the, the, how those things are laid out in your AMP. Those are all there. Okay. Now I'll get on to the Google Docs. Got my time. Okay. Google Docs V2, as Mike Farman said at, the, at, at our opening, um, is a complete rewrite of Google Docs. Um, how many people use the original Google Docs integration? One? That sounds about right um, from what we've kind of done. Uh, it's a complete rewrite of that uh, integration. We wanted to function on usability. We found that the original one wasn't very usable, and we think that's why a lot of people didn't use it, um, and add some functionality in it to make it uh, a very streamlined user experience. Uh, in the Google Docs v2, there is no shared account. In the original one, there was one account created in Google Docs, and everyone who checked out documents checked out to that account and used that. Uh, now, everyone who uses Google Docs and, v and V2 can create and edit their content in their own directory. Uh, Google is used as an editor and not as a persistence later. This is not a checkout to Google, and then you can go or publish to Google Docs, and you can go and use that. Um, but it's, a, uh, it's a solely to be used as an editor. Uh, it's an add-on, so not part of the core, so we can move or have a development cycle that is different than the core product. It, hopefully, we have, if, as there's bug, bug releases, we can have more frequent releases or updates of the add-on that won't affect the core, core of that. And our target for this is uh, cloud, enterprise, and community, and currently community is the only, uh, only released version of that. Um, also, if you are Google Docs users, you're probably all now Google Drive users. Uh, there is an API change uh, that is expected at some point. Um, the Google Docs API has been deprecated. Uh, I, think, I think we figured out it has two years left or so. We're not really sure. <laughs> it wasn't super clear on that one. But at some point, we will address that. It did change then some of the functionality of how, how things or how we expected things to work. But everything is, seems to be working right now. And eventually, it will become a Google Drive integration. All right, so now we want to do a demo. As you can see, we're already kind of into that demo right there. Um, <clears throat> let's move back. Okay, move into our document library. And there goes my computer. Give me a second here. Yay. What was that? 
Talk about drive here. All right. Come on. Wake up. All right. So I'll talk through some of the some of the things that we did as this is starting up, and we can we can do that. Um, uh, we wanted this to be a pretty seamless experience, um, th so that a user can either edit current or existing content as well as create new content. Uh, Google Docs supports four types of documents, which are pretty generic names. They have documents, they have presentations, they have spreadsheets, and they have drawings. Now, not all of those content can, can match also what our goal was, is just have a full round trip of content, that you'd be able to take content that you created or edited or had there, br bring it into Alfresco, then bring it back to Google Docs, and then bring it back into Alfresco as a seamless experience. Now, not all content supports that. Not all content can make that full round trip because it might not be a, a type of document that Google understands. Um, the other problem may be that the content or Google Docs itself doesn't have a full support of a round trip. An example of that would be uh, a drawing, a drawing file. So if we just quickly talk about uh, what Google supports for drawing, because we really liked, would have liked to have had drawing support in there. Uh, Google supports application, the MIME type is application slash x slash uh, ms metafile. Anybody know what that, that MIME type is? It's a Windows metafile. And a Windows metafile is a vector drawing. And it's more or less, I think, a proprietary vector drawing, which is the supported open or a supported office image file format. So when you take and put an image into office, it's getting changed from JPEG ping, whatever it is, that you GIF, whatever you put in there, and changed into this file to be embedded in their documents. Google supports being able to take, or take those file types and only those file types into Google Docs, but, but then allows you to be able to export any other, it, it, export it as a GIF. Uh, actually, they don't support GIF, they support JPEG, ping, and PDF. Um, we also would, didn't want to do, we, didn't, we decided that we weren't going to do PDFs. Um, part of that is for fidelity reasons. Uh, we can't guarantee completely the fidelity of a PDF file going in and coming out of how it may be rendered or how it would be changed. So we wanted to protect you from that. We also can't guarantee fidelity of all of those documents, but you have a bit more control whenever you put it into things like Office or that to be able to, 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 to handle those. All right, give me a second here to do that, do this. Okay. So to be able to do our create content, um, we had to do, looking at creating content. Move that one. Um, has anyone here ever modified the create content menu in share? No? All right. It's a, a sort of, yeah, sort of. Yeah, it's still coming back up, so I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so it's, it was a, it's a pretty involved process to, for that create content menu to be able to do, to do different things. Um, the, uh, so what we wanted was a simple way to be able to do that. So the, uh, the doclib has this new extension framework that allows you to be able to have these new callback actions where you can, where you can have it call a JavaScript, you can have it uh, reference a link that's external to share, or a link in share. So we have a, what we call link and page link. Uh, we wanted to see the same functionality for the create content menu. So now within Alfresco, or what Alfresco uh, as of 4.1, um, and it, it is in community 4.2, you now have the simplified way of being able to create content uh, using a, a callback. Um, create, uh, you have this little blurb, and we'll see us here in a second, a little XML blurb to be able to define that relationship or that action and then be able to reference a JavaScript that then is able to, to perform that. Okay. Let's try going back into it. There we go.
Okay. That one wasn't me. All right. Okay, so now we see in our create content menu, beyond just having plain text, HTML and XML, we now have a, a Google Docs document, a Google Docs spreadsheet, and a Google Docs presentation. And those are all controlled by, 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 that, by that option, and we'll go into those in just a second. If you have existing content, it's like a sweet spot right in the screen right there. Um, you also have down there somewhere, that's a folder, um, scroll on the page. You have, if the document um, is a supported type, uh, we have an action then that will show up in uh, edit in Google Docs. For our actions, we need, actually need to have a series of chained evaluators that, that occur. Uh, we check to see first, is, is, the, is, the, is the document currently being edited? When a document is being edited in Alfresco, we apply uh, a, a, an edited in Google aspect to, to the document. We also need to check for uh, if does the user have write permissions? For that one, and that's actually part of the uh, of the evaluator, uh, for uh, not part of the evaluator, part of the action, of whether or not the user has the ability to write to that node uh, in Alfresco. We needed to check uh, the size. Google Docs has a limitation on the size of the files that it can edit. So a document, the maximum, and actually it's actually a pretty complex set of of things beyond beyond just uh, a file size. They actually for a document, they actually go to a number of characters that are in the file. We opted for the, the, for the lesser of those so we wouldn't have to do any of these com complex looking, uh, looking into the document to find out different things. Because uh, spreadsheets, it has, maximum, it has things like complexity of the formulas. It has the number of rows, the number of pages that, you ha that, it, that it tries to limit on those. So we opted for the easy one, which was uh, the size. So a document is limited to two megs. A spreadsheet is limited to 20 megs. And a PowerPoint presentation or a presentation is limited to 50 megs of this. So we have a, an evaluator for the size of, of that document. We also have, um, uh, when we're looking at that aspect, I jumped down the wrong hoop. This is one of those lessons that I learned, is looking closer at these things. I jumped down the wrong hoop, and I created my own evaluator to look to see whether or not some, a, a document has an aspect. Mike Hatfield, back in the back corner, kindly pointed out to me that there was a different way of being able to do that. And there's an example of that in the slides of how to actually negate the output of an evaluator so that you, so you can reverse it, which is simpler and you don't have to write all this Java code then to be able to do it. Um, we also needed to make sure that it was a supported MIME type. Now the MIME types for, our, for Google Docs, uh, Google actually, where you get those from is whenever you log into a Google Docs account, you ask for a, a information from, the use, from, from Google about that user's account, it gives you a list of what kind of documents that it supports being able to be imported and exported. Well, that's not possible if you haven't actually logged in there, so we wouldn't be able to display that for, for those users. But we can go and update that information once we have it. So we have a default set or a default list of MIME types, plus the Google document or content type is what I call it, of a document, a spreadsheet, or a presentation where we have this mapping in our spring bean that then can be passed over as a custom response on, on, for all of our nodes. And then we can use our evaluator to look at that and be able to say, is the current MIME type listed in this, in this list that we have to be able to edit, uh, edit those documents? Um, we have the same thing for exports. So there's a list of exports because, because there are types that we can be ex content can be exported as, but we want to limit that so that we only are round tripping documents. So about every Google Doc can be saved as an HTML page or as a PDF file. Well, HTML pages can't be round tripped uh, through Google Docs. They quietly remove that functionality without telling anyone. Um, they, uh, a PDF file is not one that we wanted to support. So we have a, a specific list as well as what we, what the appropriate file extension is for those documents so that we can match those, up, match those up. So we have write permission, we have size of the document, we have if it has the aspect. Um, uh, there's another one in there. Uh, 
uh, there's also whether or not we have, whether or not the Google Docs service is turned on or off. So as an administrator, uh, in the community edition, you can go to your repository, uh, your, your Alfresco Global Repo uh, Alfresco Global Repository Properties file and be able to turn the integration on or off. And the enterprise version, you can go through J JMX and be able to turn it on or off. But we also didn't want it to make it so that if users had content that they were editing, that would, they would be stranded. So we, um, so we allow you so that if your content is currently being edited, if the, con if the system is off, it will... Um, uh, it will then allow the user to continue to edit their doc content until they save it back into Alfresco, at which point it's, uh, it's, it's done. Um, the resume uh, actually has only two things that are evaluated, whether or not it has this, this Google Doc editing Google Docs aspect. And then it uses one of the indicator, ev ind indicator evaluators of whether or not the file is locked and if the lock owner is that user. Because we only want the user to be able to go back in. The person who put that lock in or has it checked out to their Google Docs account to be able to go back in and edit it. So here we have, actually let's go up and we'll create a new document first. Go to our Google Docs, um, create a Google document. So this is going to go through um, to see. Uh, here we have actually an OAuth check that's going on. So Google Docs uses OAuth to be able to do this one. Um, the OAuth flow within Alfresco actually happens in a couple steps, and it's initiated first by the JS, by the JS when the user clicks edit or create that content. Um, we have a call that goes to a web script, and that web script then goes to the Spring, goes to our Google Docs service, which calls into the uh, Spring Social Google Docs and gets the authentication URL. And this is the URL that the user should be directed to to be able to enter in their credentials. That URL is then passed back to the share side, and then the share side opens either a, a modal dialog or a new window um, so that the user can then enter in their credentials and approve access for this application to access their Google Docs account. Um, once that's done, that page closes. To be able to handle the cloud side of this one, I've got 10 minutes, okay, I gotta hurry on this. Um, it then um, goes out to the alfresco.com website has a page that then does some special handling on the URL that retur is returned back that has the authorization code, strips that out, passes that back through the user's browser so they can go back to Alfresco, and then uses our OAuth 2 service within Alfresco to be able to persist those tokens for the user session so that during different parts of this, the user doesn't have to go in and make changes or different, different things that are going on. So here we go. Here's our Alfresco editor. We have very simple. We want it to be very pretty and unintrusive. We wanted the user to be able to have all the full functionality of their Google, of the Google Docs application. We have a return button. This takes the user back into the Alfresco doc lib. Um, we have a discard changes, um, which then allows basically any changes that you've made here or get wiped out. If this was a new document that you've created, that document is actually removed from Alfresco uh, at, at that time. Um, it also does a concurrent user check. So if there are other users that are concurrently editing, that, editing, that occur, occur, occur as well. So let's actually show that right now. So I'm going to share this document. Okay. I am... Who has access? Can I see that? Okay. Let's go. Pmonks. I'm going to add... I think it's the green one. <laughs> Peter Monks, who's sitting here in the front row, to this document. All right, so we've now added that change. Um, and i got to figure out how I can close this window. Bring it over here, resize it, go down. Yes. There we go. Yes. And so here is Peter's now making changes to this document. And yes, I need a new laptop. As soon as DevCon is over, this is going to the shop to get fixed. So you can collaboratively edit. Now, this collaboration editing session lives for as long as the user has this document 
in the editing mode. Once they have saved this document, this, the URL that the user received by email is no longer valid and they can no longer access it. If the user goes in to edit this document again, they cannot use that URL to access that document because this is a, a brand, it will be a new document once again in Google Docs. Once the user saves the document or discards the document, it deletes the document from, from, uh, from Google Docs. As we said, this is, Google Docs is not a persistence layer. This is an editor. That's the only functionality that we want to be able to have or use with that one. It's a nice shade of yellow. Yes, it is a nice shade of yellow. We also wanted to be able to support uh, renaming a document. DevCon DOX. Now, DOC. Now this should, if I'm remembering right, the default format for this will be, so if we save this, see that Peter was currently editing it, so now do we want to continue? Um, if he was making other, making other changes while we were making the save, that would have a problem. So it should now be, if we scroll down our document list, our devcon.doc, so it's a, it's a Windows 97 document. We support full round tripping well, when we were in development. Um, Windows, or Google added support for uh, uh, Office 2007 documents, so we support Office 97, Windows two uh, Office 2000 documents, text documents, go, go through this as well. Open Office documents, open Office format, uh, you can bring in Got to make sure we do this right. You can bring in OpenOffice 2.0 version file formats. So this is your uh, OX, ODX, is that the right for our format? Um, but it can't output that format. So you'll get a warning that it will downgrade that format to or change that file into the older Office file format as, as a little bit of a warning. We can also create spreadsheets. We can create... Um, uh, presentations, as you see with my, with my presentation, being able to do this one. We can also edit uh, any any content. So we have one is we can resume and go right back into it or edit it. So actually, let's jump back to this and try to take a look at some of these things as we're moving through here. So our architecture for this is actually pretty interesting. Is that we have Google as the Google Docs is out in the cloud for us. We have the repository side, which is our Google Docs service, which handles most of, most of our work uh, around the document. And then we have the share side. The share and the repository obviously talk to be able to move content back and forth. But the repository talks to Google uh, uh, to be able to move our content, retrieve our content from that one. The share side also talks to, uh, to, to Google, and that's to be able to retrieve our editor. And there was a little bit of a, some hoops that we had to jump through to be able to make um, the editor appear. While OAuth gives you the ability to access the APIs, it does not give you the ability to call into their web interface. Got five minutes. Okay, cool. Um, so you have to be able to be able to do that one. And so one of the ways you can make that work is by forcing the user to authenticate again. Uh, and so we, uh, through the OAuth interface, we abuse it nice, uh, nice and well that we make them sign in or create new OAuth tokens to be able to go through and, and use that service again. All right. Uh, the credential service, there's an OAuth 1 and OAuth 2. This is for persisting your c credentials. You can use this to, either uh, to persist either shared, so multiple users can use this set of tokens, or individual users' uh, tokens on those. Those are encrypted. So you don't have to worry about those. And it persists all of the basic information about your OAuth token. So if it's OAuth 2, it's your access token. It's your refresh token. It's the, uh, the lifespan of the token, that TTL of that, uh, of that token uh, in there as well. We also allow you to be able to create the I or put in the issue date so that you can do some calculations on when refreshes may, may occur with that. Uh, but those, you'll be able to go to the slides to be able to see how to use that service in there. Um, we provide, here's some information about, uh, in there about doing the create content action, um, how those would work, how you could design that one. The three options that are available. Ev evaluators are currently not supported, but I have a conversation this morning with the developer who helped us with that, and at some point we hope to have in the future the ability able to put evaluators on there, just like you can have evaluators in the doc lib action, uh, actions. Uh, and here's just a little 
how you would, what your JS would look like for one of those scripts, or how, you, how those would work. Um, we talked about our doclib actions. I think I got all of those. And I provide information in the slides about what those all look like, um, some little gotchas on, on those. Uh, there's our little bonus about that. What the evaluators would look like, how the Google Doc services get turns on and off. So we're coming up close to the end of the time. How to chain them uh, with the resume uh, editors. We talked about how the OAuth flow works within those, how we persist the tokens back and forth. This is one that was really cool that I learned when doing this was uh, rollbacks. Back when, uh, in the Hibernate days, if you had a transaction that failed on the Java side, that was it. You were done. You couldn't do anything anymore. Could put Finny. That was it. Um, with Ibatis, one of the things that we can do is that we can actually have a rollback callback, which allows you, if a transaction fails, to have, a roll, have, a, have this callback that allows you to then be able to perform other functions within that. That could be a cleanup notifications in Alfresco or outside to a third party service, be able to send notifications, provide some unit of work to this, to this code to be able to do that. Um, in this case, we're catching it in this exception that was being thrown that we knew was possibility. Uh, Alfresco transaction support, we create a new transport listener for this one. And then we have this after rollback callback that's getting created here. And that's the work you do. If false and true is whether or not uh, the transaction is, should be read only or not, and whether or not it should be a new transaction outside of that one. Um, I haven't a chance. There's some other ones. Uh, other ones. This is the one I think that I would stick to for being able to handle this. I wouldn't look at things like uh, before transaction, before or before commit, after commit. Those to me seem a little dangerous to be able to touch, but the rollback seems to be one that's pretty safe outside uh, of it to be able to use. And in this case, we were just we needed to throw another exception then up so that the client could be able to handle that one. Um, also provide in here, if you've never created or been afraid to create a subsystem in Alfresco, um, anything that you expose, any properties they expose through your spring beans are automatically exposed as read-only properties. But you can create, if you want those to be read-write, for you enterprise customers, if you want those to be read-write, you can create a subsystem in Alfresco and expose those, and those are automatically able to rewrite and then be able to turn those on and off. So we provide some information in the slides as well on how you can create that. It's actually really simple, and it's not something to be too afraid of doing. Uh, example of how ours looks, what ours looks like. Um, category is that upper one, authentication, um, file system, those are the ones. Uh, our type name is then the one underneath, uh, is what appears under that one. You don't, uh, usually it's default. Many of those are default, but in this case we needed version two of that one. And this is actually the path to what that one should be. And whether or not it should be started when Alfresco should be that one. Some best practices, I like to keep my model uh, uh, in with my subsystem so it doesn't live outside, so all those files are together. Web scripts cannot be live inside of a uh, of a subsystem. Um, they actually live in their own container and can't be restarted and started because it doesn't know how to do that discovery down to be able to do, to do that one. Um, you should also test, if you create a system, you should also test what happens when you unload them. Is the behavior that you're seeing acceptable? Uh, if you create a subsystem uh, and you call a service that was in that subsystem and it had already been loaded, it will reload that subsystem. If you don't want that to happen, you need to programmatically control so that if things happen, they won't, they won't do that. And that's one of the things that we have th that explains how e-users are able to continue with the Google Docs functionality once the, the, the system is turned off. The property will remain false, even though the system may be running for different things. Uh, and that's it. I hope like, you're able to dram a lot of stuff in there. If you have any questions about the Google Docs integration, any of those projects that you want to help participate in, uh, Jive Toolkit, Dropbox, uh, any of the other project lists that you see out there, any of the ones that are community-based, I'm more than happy, we're more than happy to talk to you. Share Extras, PDF Toolkit, um, those are kind of uh, the ones that we've worked with for a long time. Questions about using Maven, you can ask Sam, he's in the front row. Don't ask me, I just play like I know what I'm doing there. Um, uh, and that's it. Hopefully that was informative to, to you guys and learned something new. And again, all that information is in the slides that we talked about more in depth and you'll be able to use those for, for examples. Okay, thanks.